Okay, so I've got a little bit of time and way too many topics to talk about and some very bright lights. So I'm going to try to uh, introduce a bunch of different things for you to think about over the next couple of hours as we do a bunch of panels. So hi, I'm Roger from Tor. We're a nonprofit. We write privacy software. Uh, we're, it's open source. Uh, it's an open network. One of the fun things about Tor is the community around the world of developers and researchers. We're a US 501c3 nonprofit. We've got millions of users who use it every day, and we're part of the larger ecosystem of internet freedom, privacy, anti-censorship uh, research. Okay, so the first thing to think about when you're trying to think about a privacy system, what's the threat model? What sort of attacker are you imagining? And so we've got Alice over here. She's trying to browse the web to some website, Bob. Where can the attacker be? Maybe the attacker is watching Alice's local network. Maybe it's Starbucks or the Tunisian internet agency. Uh, or maybe the attacker is part of the network in the middle. They're trying to uh, infiltrate or run proxies or the take over part of the internet. Or maybe the attackers on the destination side, maybe they're watching WikiLeaks and they're trying to figure out who talks to them. Or maybe the attacker is the destination. Maybe it's CNN and you want privacy from them so they don't get to build a database of what news articles you read. So what are the other key parts? Anonymity is not the same as encryption. Encryption is good, you should use encryption, but even when you're using encryption, somebody watching you still gets to learn who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how much you're talking to them. And that's actually, like the CIA doesn't try to break encryption at this point. They build the social graph of who's talking to who, they try to figure out who's in the middle of that social graph, and then they break into your house and uh, steal your laptop or, uh, or other attacks like that. So, how many people here recognize creepy NSA dude? I see some hands. Okay, so, yeah, there's this uh, crazy or normal phrase from creepy NSA dude a couple of years ago, we kill people based on metadata, and he just said it matter-of-factly, like that's the, the most ordinary thing in the world. So, communications metadata is exactly what I'm talking about today. And it didn't end there. They've been hassling organizations like Facebook to become scared of rolling out end-to-end -end encryption. So that uh, backdoor versus protecting your users question is one that we're going to be talking a lot about today. Okay, I actually only use the word anonymity when I'm talking to other researchers. When I'm talking to my parents and, and other ordinary citizens, I tell them I'm working on a privacy system. When I'm talking to Google and Walmart and other companies, I work on communication security or network security. Because they don't care about privacy, they don't know what anonymity is, but security, yeah, they, they do need that. When I'm talking to governments, militaries, law enforcement, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. And again, it's the same security properties, but if you go to the government and say, I have a privacy system, they don't know why they need that. But if you explain that I have a, a mechanism for protecting tra against traffic analysis so you can send your diplomat to Israel and nobody learns what her affiliation is when they're watching the hotel room. Now that's actually something they care about. And then another category of people who, who need this stuff are the human rights activists who are trying to get to BBC or other websites around the world and they can't get there. So part of the fun of working on systems like Tor is getting all these different groups who need it for different reasons to blend together into the same anonymity set. Okay, so how do you build one of these? The easy answer is a centralized proxy like most VPN companies that you're used to, where all the users send their traffic into the central point and it all comes out. And the first problem there is, uh, what if that company is, is going bad? What if it wants to sell your data and so on? And it's worse than that because even if that company is good, there's still a central point where if you get to watch the traffic going in, you can match it up with the traffic going out and it, it's pretty straightforward. So years ago, I was talking to one of these anonymizer co companies, and he was saying, we never answer subpoenas. If we ever answered a subpoena, nobody would trust us ever again. So of course, we never answer subpoenas. And then I was doing a talk for the US Department of Justice a year or so later, and they were like, why can't you be like anonymizer.com? It's easy. We send them a subpoena. They send us an answer. It's easy. Why can't you be like that? So I, I don't say this to pick on a particular VPN company. The problem is the architecture. The problem is the centralization. It's the privacy by, by promise, privacy by trust. They have all the data. They promise not to screw you. 
and there's no way for you to be able to know whether they're going to follow through on those promises or not. So the idea for Tor is distributed trust, decentralized, so there's no single place that knows both you and what you're doing. So now it's about privacy by design, it's about the architecture of the system keeping you safe rather than about uh, having a central corporation and hoping that they follow through. Okay, and the Tor network has grown uh, quite a bit over the past many years. If you zoom back in time, the graph also looks uh, up and to the right. So another thing to, that we've been wrestling with, how do you measure the, the safety that comes from, from using Tor? So one answer is, the more volunteer relays we have all around the world, the safer it becomes. Because the more relays we have, the harder it is to be in a position to watch enough of them. But another answer is diversity of why people use it. We have hundreds of thousands of people in Iran using Tor right now, and if they were all hardcore political dissidents, that would be bad news for all of them. The reality is that almost all of them are people who are looking at their web comics or their pictures of cute cats on Facebook, and that got censored, so now they're using Tor to get around the censorship, and that ordinariness is critical to their security. The fact that most people who are using Tor in a given situation are not the, the sorts of people that the attacker wants to collect uh, is critical to safety. Okay, so there's another piece. I talked about Tor, the network level privacy. There's a second piece to what Tor is, which is the web browser level, the application level privacy. And that's things like cookies and what languages you prefer and what fonts you have installed and so on. So the Tor browser tries to protect all of that at the application layer. And that's important for uh, any application that's trying to use Tor, all the cryptocurrency things out there. Long ago, BitTorrent wrote your IP address in the application level traffic. So if you send your BitTorrent traffic over Tor, Tor does its job. It anonymously sends your IP address to the other side. That may not be what you had in mind. Uh, so there's another fun piece of the browser side. DuckDuckGo did a study a while ago on what people think private browsing mode is, and many of them think it is what Tor Browser does. They're mistaken. Private browsing mode only protects like somebody looking at the disk after you used that computer. But there are systems like Brave that are integrating Tor to make their private browsing mode actually private. Okay, so there are a couple of lessons that I'd like us to think about over the course of today. One of them is transparency. So yes, we're open source, we're free software, we give you design documents, we give you specifications, we say, hi, I'm Roger from Tor. Uh, that transparency is critical to building a community that you can trust. And always there's somebody in the audience who's like, oh, ha, ha, the anonymity people are talking about transparency, ha, ha. Uh, no, privacy is about choice. And we choose to be transparent in order to be more trustworthy, in order to be able to build, grow, sustain a community of people who, who know each other and trust each other. So speaking of growing that community, that's also a topic we're going to talk about in the panels today. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, different approaches to building your volunteer ecosystem. Do you do the cryptocurrency thing where you try to, like, let's make a market out of it, let's, let's assume capitalism is the right way to build things? Uh, or do you take the anarchist approach where you assume that altruists will help you out? Uh, funding is tied into this also. Do you... Do you get government funding? Do you charge your users? Do you try to create a cryptocurrency? Those are all crummy for different reasons. Uh, happy to chat about that. Speaking of community, uh, framing and getting high profile users and having them be the sorts of people that, that people think of when they think of your tool is, is an important step. It, we'll talk about that more in the plausible deniability panel. But uh, Ed is one of the higher profile users of Tor. And the fun thing about that, we only know that he used Tor because he told us. So there are a lot of people out there successfully using Tor who haven't mentioned it to us. We can't put them on a slide as a case study. Another uh, more messy example, there's a fellow named Ola Bini in Ecuador who is being prosecuted for uh, basically being in the wrong time at the wrong place with the wrong friends. And he has recently been declared uh, innocent, which is awesome. But one of the reasons why I got involved as an expert witness there is he used Tor as part of the bullshit claim that they had against him. So we got to try to teach the judges there what Tor is, why it's ordinary, why everybody uses it all the time. Okay, so another thing, technology is not neutral. 
So power imbalances are central to how Tor works and why Tor is important. If you are a vulnerable person, Tor is more useful for you than if you're a government or a large organization. And uh, I think this, this framing originally came from Harry a while ago. Technology is not neutral. Technology is inherently political. If you don't think through the impact of your tool, you're going to accidentally end up reinforcing the existing power structures. So if you want to build a decentralized thing that is more useful for vulnerable people, then you need to think through how to build that decentralized tool. And that doesn't mean that we need to like or endorse all the people who use our system. Somewhere out there are assholes who are trading child exploitation stuff, and if they use Tor, they're Screw you, I don't want you doing that. You're hurting my system, you're hurting the other people who need good privacy for the system. So there's definitely a discussion to be had uh, around absolute free speech, boo, versus how do you frame things, how do you community build. Um, but the, the other important point there, the system needs to not have backdoors. The system has to be agnostic about uh, what sort of user is using it. But that, that's very different than how we, how we frame it, how we talk about it, which users we highlight. So speaking of crypto wars, I think we've got a, a panel on that coming up soon. One of the things we need to do is look at the win that we got from HTTPS. So 10, 15 years ago, everybody was using HTTP, no encryption, and now it's normal. Your bank does it, everybody expects it. Every, like your browser pops up a thing saying, there's not encryption, this is bad, something's gone wrong. So at the same time, while that debate was happening, the NSA reveal came out and, and we learned that the NSA watches you more carefully if you use encryption or they store your traffic for longer if you use encryption. And at the same time, we learned that maybe they record traffic from Tor users longer because they can recognize that it's Tor. So at the time, we had some people saying, oh man, I'm not gonna use Tor because I hear the NSA watches you more if you're gonna use Tor. So imagine me coming here and saying, I'm not gonna use HTTPS because I hear people look at me more when I use encryption, so I'm gonna not have any encryption and that'll keep me safe. That's crazy talk, nobody would, would say that. So part of the challenge we have in the communications metadata question is how do we get to the point where all of this is normalized enough that everybody expects to be protected against traffic analysis, against people looking at their metadata. And then the other piece of that is we need as many ordinary users doing ordinary things, normalizing this as we can. This was actually a blog post by Facebook a couple of years ago talking about how they looked at their data set to find out that millions of people are logging into Facebook each month over Tor. And you, you need that ordinariness in the system. Okay, another topic that I've only got one slide for is about censorship. Censorship implies surveillance. If you are in Tunisia or Australia or wherever censoring is happening, they're watching you to learn whether they want to allow you to get to that website or not. So there's also a recurring theme where Palantir, Cisco, Bluecoat, Intel, and so on, these Western companies are the ones building the oppression tools that then get deployed in Syria and Saudi Arabia and so on. And censorship is becoming more common around the world. We've got Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, England. They're all excited about censoring the internet. They're all rolling out their censorship infrastructure. So we've got a lot of policy work to be done there. It's not just Iran and Russia and so on. Another key thing to think about in terms of how to be safer is the privacy research. So we have a, a huge community of people around us who are in academia, who are doing privacy research, uh, trying to attack Tor, trying to understand Tor, trying to improve Tor, because uh, Tor is hard to break. So that's where the fun challenge is, and that's where the respect comes from when you write your research paper. Uh, and the, the flip side of that is that we need to help them clarify, identify research papers, uh, and so on, problems that we need solved. Okay, and then uh, for the last thought, and I'd be happy to chat more about any of these. Calls to action, understand the risks of centralized architectures. I think in the cryptocurrency space, you're pretty good at, at knowing decentralization is important. 
Let's all think more about the slippery slope that is internet censorship. I didn't talk much about it in the 15 minutes, but there's a lot more to talk about. Help us with the privacy research. There's a conference called PetSymposium.org. Uh, volunteer with Tor, run part of the infrastructure, a relay, a bridge. Snowflake is one of the anti-censorship proposals we've got. And we're a nonprofit, so feel free to donate. And with that, I am out of time, and I'm going to hand it to the next panel. Thank you.